when the Holy Ghost comes, he manifests himself in different ways. When the presence of God comes, some scream, some cry, some laugh, some roll, some shake, some twist, some jump. It's by reason of the power of God that is like Zessa. The Zessa power. When you put your hand into that socket and you encounter the real power, you have no control sometimes. Over. You can't jump, dig, dig, you can't jump or scream. <laughs> you can't choose how you jump or how you scream. You just jump and you just scream. That's exactly what happens when the Holy Ghost comes. But let's reserve that for another session. How is that? Thank you, worship team. They are so saturated with the presence of God. And when there's such a saturation of the presence of God, the prophetic comes. God reveals things to his prophets to unlock certain things in people's lives. And I would have loved to do that, but for the next session. For now, I want to focus on what we are here for. 100% manifestation of the call of God. 100% manifestation of the call of God. If I'd said 100% manifestation of cars, people are going to be standing. I am not here to preach about cars. I am here to preach about the call of God. The heart of God. And then the cars will follow. I said the cars will follow. Those that seek after him. Seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and some of these things some of these things how many all these things shall be added unto us so I'm not worried about your car or your house I am not worried about your promotion or your job I know when I preach the word those things follow I know when you do the word those things follow because that is the life we have lived for the last how many years? Over 40 years. That's the life we have lived. Just seeking hard after God. And God adds to us. Hallelujah. Godly families, godly children, promotions, lots of money. Lots of cars, lots of friends. We have seen it over and over again. So we don't put the cart before the horse. I said we don't put the cart before the horse. The cart follows the horse. So seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto us. And they will by end of the conference to be like popcorn. The testimonies, uncommon testimonies, will be like popcorn in the spirit realm. It will be done as long as you say yes to the call of God. So the call of God. 100% manifestation of the call of God. The call of God, part one. The call of God. I'm going to do a series on the call of God. What is the call of God. What is to be called? What does it mean to be called? What is the call of God? To be called of God means to be summoned. Summoned. Distinctly summoned. What does it mean to be called? It means to be appointed for a special purpose. What is the call of God? It means to be separated for God's plans. 
What do you mean by the call of God? It means to be sent out properly. There are many that just wake up today and say they have the call of God, but they have not been sent. They are not sent out properly. To be called by God means to be sent out properly. Some people just go. And when you go, you are not assured of any of God's blessings. The Greek word sent is apostello, from where apostle is a stem. It means to set someone apart, to send someone out properly on a mission. If you are not sent out properly, your authority will be challenged. If you are out of order as a minister, and you are not sent out properly, there are many demons that you cannot cast out. So every minister must strive to be ordained and to be sent out properly to ensure the blessing upon the work that you are doing. Genesis 45 verse 7. Exodus 3 verse 15. To be called means receiving a ministry from God. To be called means the release of the gift in you. To be called means to receive a talent from God. And in some cases, to be called means to receive an office. Many are called. Matthew chapter 22 verse 14. But few are chosen. Why is that? That's what I will address in the midst of my sermon today. Many are called. This is a fact. There are six billion people in the world. If you were God, would you send one pastor, one anointed man of God, to try and touch the lives of six billion people? Would you send ten men of God or women of God, prominent men of God, to bring salvation <coughs> to six billion people if you were God? Would you send 10 people to save 6 billion people? You need many people to touch many lives. That's why many are called. Many means large numbers of people. Many means numerous. But they don't know it. Many means countless. We can't count. Many means lots of people. Many means the majority of people are called. But they don't know it. That's why they are not chosen. Many means most people are called. Large numbers, masses of people are called. But only a few are chosen. And in this conference, we want to be the chosen few. I said by the end of this conference, 
I want to be part of the chosen few because I have understood what it takes to be chosen. First of all, I've understood what the call is. Next, I've understood some facts about the call of God. Many times in churches, and this is good, there's nothing wrong with that, but it's rather sad that we spend most of our sermons focusing on teaching the congregants how to have a better life how to have a better this better that and all that is good it's a gospel because the gospel is good news but it becomes sad when after all is said and done people are now living the better life but people cannot do much for god that is a sad story So, the reason pastors teach or preach like that is because it has not entered some of their minds that many are called. That it is not just the superstars. It is not just the pastor who is called. Many are called. So it is my job as an apostle to ensure that every person within the hearing of my voice understands that multitudes are called, masses, millions of people, not just a few select superstars are called because there are six billion people that must be saved, that must be delivered. The pastor, even with his wife, they cannot do it. Many are called. So, Ephesians chapter 4, I will read it again. Pastors, apostles, evangelists, teachers, we are supposed to perfect the saints so that the saints can be equipped to do the work of the ministry. So while life is getting better, we are getting better jobs, we are getting better behaved children, we are getting better promotions, we are getting bigger cars. It is so that the work of the ministry may be done. If you know God, you will say amen. amen. That is the whole purpose of church. That's the whole purpose of restoring lives. The reason God restores our lives is so that we can equip them, those lives, to do the work of the ministry. So he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and some teachers but for what reason so that and the man of god with the power the man of the hour with the power so that i have people running around me and kneeling in front of me never thank you never not in my lifetime i don't want anybody worshiping me because I have to give an account before God. Yeah. Why am I an apostle? So that I can equip the saints. So that I can train the saints for the work of the ministry. So that there's nobody who dies, goes to heaven, and cries for eternity. 
My Bible tells me how many know that there will be saints in heaven who will be crying. Because whose tears will Jesus be wiping? And he will be wiping away the tears of the saints. Why will the saints be crying? The saints will be crying because pastors, we wasted your time telling you, receive! Receive your car! And you received your car and you died and you went to hell. Okay, maybe you went to heaven, you are the one. Now Jesus is wiping your tears. Why would you be crying? Because I wasted your time. I never told you the full gospel. I never taught you the full gospel. I never told you the reason your life is restored is so that you can restore others. I never told you that the reason I'm an apostle is not so that you lay out nice tables and you hold my hand back. Ah, in fact, I can hold my own hand back. Thank you very much. It is so that I can equip the saints, train men and women that will be ready to go. When he calls them, they say yes, and they go. That's the reason I am an apostle. Proudly so. Proudly, Jesus is. Hello? Are you hearing, Chiru I am proudly Jesus is. chips, fish and chips and chicken. Hey, Diko. Hey, hello. I'm here to worship God. If you want to give me all those things, bring them to my house. Here I here I come here to worship God. If you really love me, show me at my house. Uh, with all due respect, I know someone was doing it with their whole heart, trying to show their honor. But you know how it has been taken to extremes. Hello, not here, in, not in this church. And I'm, I know you'll be seeing it in other churches. Here we don't do that. We don't worship pastors. Pastors, we are servants. I said, apostles, we are servants. We are here to serve you. We understand our mandate to restore your life and to raise the champion on the inside of you. For the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. That is the call of a pastor, of an evangelist, of a prophet, of a teacher, of an apostle. I'll put it the wrong way around. Starting with the apostle, the prophet, and the evangelist and uh, the pastor and the teacher. So, I want to illustrate your life using the life of Saul. Not Saul who became Paul, but Saul in the Old Testament. So I want you to turn, as we talk about the call of God on your life, I want you to identify your life in 1 Samuel chapter 9. And you understand as I illustrate with the life of soul, how your life may have the call of God, but you are so unaware of it. And we're going to walk through this, walk through the Bible together for you to understand how this conference will unlock or manifest your calling. First Samuel chapter 9, going to pick verse 1 and verse 3 to 6, verse 16 to 17, verse 20 to 24. First Samuel chapter 9. And I repeat, the topic is the call of God, part 1. So part 1. The title of part one is Destiny is Calling. Destiny is Calling. Verse one. There was a wealthy man. Listen to that. An influential man named Kish from the tribe of Benjamin. He was the son of Abiel, the son of Zero, the son of Bekorath, and the son of Aphia of the tribe of Benjamin. 
verse 3 to 6. One day, Kish's donkeys strayed away, and he told Saul, take a servant with you, go look for the donkeys. And so Saul took one of the servants and traveled through the hill country of Ephraim, the land of Shalisha, the Shalim area, the entire land of Benjamin, but they couldn't find the donkeys anywhere. Finally, they entered the region of Zuf, and Saul said to his servant, Ah, let's go home. By now my father will be more worried about us than even about the donkeys. But the servant said, Hey, this is now verse... Um, what, what verse? But the servant said, I've just thought of something. What verse is that? Verse 6. There is a man of God who lives here in this town. He's held in high honor by all the people because everything he says comes true. Let's go find him. Perhaps he can tell us which way to go. About this time tomorrow, verse 16. For time's sake, I've skipped many verses to verse 16. This was God speaking to the men of God before these two arrived. About this time tomorrow, I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin. Anoint him to be the leader of my people Israel. He will rescue them from the Philistines. For I have looked down on my people in mercy and I've heard their cry. So when Samuel saw Saul, Samuel was the man of God, the prophet, who when he spoke, things happened. When Samuel saw Saul, the Lord said to Samuel, that's the man I told you about. He will rule my people. I'm here to say to somebody today, before you came to this conference, God spoke to us. And God is saying about you, that's the man I told you about. He will rule over my people. He will rescue my people from their distress. Before you came, God spoke to us, to this conference. Says, that's the man. That's the woman. Anoint him. Verse 20. And don't worry about those donkeys that were lost three days ago. This is now the man of God. The servant of God. The prophet of God. Talking to these two who had not told him anything about their lost donkeys. Who had not told him anything about how many days it had taken them looking for these donkeys. I'm here to say to somebody today, you came to this conference rather with your life like Saul's life. Your father lost his donkeys and your father has sent you throughout your life on a donkey chasing mission for a long time. I don't know how long it is for you. You've just been chasing donkeys up and down, back and forth. Educated, but no progress. Saul was a rich man. I mean, Saul's father, Kish was a wealthy man, very influential in society. But he sent Saul on a donkey chasing mission. That could be your story today. You've been on a donkey chasing mission. 
I even wish at least zang dai zanga ziri mombe. Mombe tai zoti tadi zwana tai zora ya tige nyama. Man, these are donkeys. We don't eat donkeys at least in Zimbabwe. Hopefully, there's no butcheries that are selling us donkey meat. You've been on a donkey chasing mission, going round and round in circles. I don't know what that donkey chasing mission has been in your life. For some people, it's a poverty for the majority of people. For many people, it's just trying to survive, just trying to put food on the table. For others, it's education, just putting two cents together to send a child to school. For others, it's just sanity in the home. They have everything, but they fight like cats and dogs daily. There are five cars parked in the garage, but no peace. For others, they have seven bedroomed houses, all fully furnished, but no sleep. Many beds, but no sleep, no peace. I don't know what your donkey chasing mission is today. But one thing I know is that there are many that have been on a donkey chasing mission. Where at the end of the day, life loses meaning. You say, is this worth living? Is this life worth living? That's why many end up considering suicide. Because life is tasteless. Life is meaningless. Life is just going round in circles. You think you're about to make it to your breakthrough. But the success, the victory, is very short-lived. If anything, before you get there, something happens. You're just about to find the donkeys. And you turn the wrong direction. Go round another mountain. Three days, so. And uh, his servant were looking for donkeys. Until they came to the right place. I'm here to say, you have come to the right place. This is the conference. Your donkey chasing mission has come to an end. In fact, the donkeys that you were looking for, the donkeys that you were worried about, the donkeys that you came to this conference so worried about you almost failed to come, they have been found. The Lord has sorted you out because he's the king of glory. He is the one who was and who is and who is to come. He is the one who knew you from before you were formed in your mother's womb and ordained you a priest and a prophet to your generation. He is the one who said three days ago, for three days you've been looking for donkeys, the donkeys have been found. For three days you'll be in this conference. The donkeys have been found. By the time you are done, as I'm going to take you through the call of God, the donkeys will have been found. Let's just read the rest. So the man of God, Samuel, said, don't worry about those donkeys that were lost three days ago. They have been found. I'm here to tell you that you and your family are the focus of all of Israel's hopes. <laughs> I am here to tell you that you and your family are the focus of all Zimbabwe's hopes. Not just Zimbabwe. Yeah. Of the hope of the nations. The nations are waiting for this anointing. Yes. Those that have never been out of the country, they don't understand what we are talking about. When we're talking about cherish the presence of God. Cherish this anointing. Ajiko kwese kwese manga manga kwa unungo wana chechi ese ese. Kuduru 
ndogo daiso uwepo wa mwari can't you ever take the presence of god the manifest glory for granted ndiri kunye pa here those that are well traveled the gospel has been hidden in africa just like jesus was hidden in africa when pharaoh was after his life we are the ones that now carry the baton stick and the torch we are the ones that's why we are so vigilant and diligent in raising this young generation to take you back to the nations to push this gospel of our lord jesus christ because vaka so rasika zvakakwana ndati vaka rasika zvikurasika zvo zvisatombozia kuti mwana mkomana hereke nati musikana at least this is from africa mwana akazvarwa tinoza kuti uyu mkomana a makorokoto a uyu musikana a makorokoto uko kurasika kwacho kwashika pakuti i can't even remember whether i am a boy or i am a girl how lost can your donkeys be you don't understand that if you are born with this anatomy you are a boy you have forgotten that's how thick the darkness and for your own info that's the reason for this national assignment takati as long as zimbabwe is zimbabwe we will remain a sovereign nation a timboda to infiltration of such confusion that we would get to the point of so deep a confusion listen to Saul's reply i told you i'm here to tell you that you and your family you are the focus of israel's hopes but you like Saul would reply me and say that i am only from the tribe of benjamin the smallest tribe in israel hello my family is the least important of all the families of that tribe that is how many of us feel inferiority complex just like so you think you are the smallest your tribe is the most insignificant you are the most insignificant in that tribe even your father's family is the smallest and you're asking why are you talking like this to me i'm just reading the scriptures that's what Saul says why are you talking like this to me saying i have the call of god the call of god do you even know me do you know what i've gone through do you really know the stuff that i'm facing that's what you are saying call of god call of god me do you know the amount of sin i have committed i won't say crime <laughs> sin i have committed the number of abortions i've had you talking to me about the call of god woman of god i think you made a mistake that's how Saul responded to Samuel then Samuel brought Saul and his servants into the hall and he placed them at the head of the table honoring them above the 30 special guests and Samuel then instructed the cook to bring to Saul the finest cut of meat the piece that had been set aside for the guest of honor and said to Saul go ahead and eat it and Samuel said it was reserved for you so Saul ate with Samuel that day somebody say hey yeah. this is the story of my life that's how i'm coming alive and this can be the story of your life 
You are just going around thinking you are looking for your father's donkeys. Number one, let's take you back. This is what I learned over my life. Number one, God can call anyone from any background. From a rich background, you are not too rich to work for God. You are not too poor to work for God. You are not too educated to work for God. You are not too uneducated to work for God. You are not too influential or too handsome or too beautiful for that matter. There are so many people that are so beautiful they are good for nothing. So you are not too anything for God. You are not too handsome. You are not too sharp and entrepreneur that you cannot work for God. That's number one point that I want to take you through. Many are called, but few are chosen. Number two point that I glean from this story. God often uses one member of the family to change the destiny of a whole family. God used Saul, who was on a donkey chasing mission, <laughs> to change not just the destiny of her family, his family, but the destiny of Israel. God can use anybody, number one. Number two, God often uses one member of the family to change the destiny of the rest of the family. Number three, third thing I learned from this story is God allows circumstances in the family God often allows circumstances in the family to drive someone towards their destiny. I don't know what the circumstances in your family are like or have been like, but God used the donkey chasing mission to drive Saul towards his God ordained destiny. I'm here to say destiny is calling. I don't know what your donkey chasing mission has been, but destiny is calling. And at this conference, as you encounter the presence of God, and as you hear God through his word, destiny is shifting. God is using you to shift the destiny of the rest of your family. And I'm speaking my testing. Amen. Speaking my testimony. Lift it up. Just to give an example. What I'm talking about. Why I'm getting thrilled and excited. You see that pretty little girl there? You see that pretty little girl there? That pretty little girl is none other than Makumayo. Guess who is the other Makumal? This one here. <laughs> Boast in Christ. That little girl is a miracle. That little girl's life existence was fought for years. Had it not been for the Lord who was on my side, let Israel say now. When man rose up against us, when our enemies fought hard against us, when the waters would have overwhelmed us, <laughs> had it not been for the Lord our God, that girl would not be in existence today. And I want you to watch the space and pray for that girl. She's got a big destiny. a woman of influence should never have existed for the fight against my young brother's life from a young age where he was dropped at birth by nurses talk about justice no recourse I can't tell you the many stories the stuff we went through 
the satanic attacks chasing our donkeys like you're all chasing your donkeys you wake up one day and somebody is bent all here bent you know gucha gucha bent there is no iron there is no fire there is no hot water but the person has third degree burns We're to wheel him in a wheelchair. On Air Zimbabwe to Bulawayo where my sister was working. And my sister was working in Bulawayo, fortunately also a born again believer. And I knew because she was working at UBH, she'd be able to take better care of him than me. The doctors, we look like fools. You know when you're chasing your donkeys? Sometimes you really feel like a fool. We're asking. What happened? I remember one of them was a family doctor. I got a petunia. I'm doing Zenjani. And you're saying you don't know? And you live with him? And we had no clue. Other than to know this is highly demonic. And this is a battle against not just his life but his seed and I fought in the spirit for the seed to be preserved I'm talking about how you can make a difference to the demonic attacks in your family how you have what it takes to stand firm immovable, abounding in the work of the Lord. I think the devil wanted us to stop working for God. <laughs> and say, if God was God, how come these things are happening to you? Well, you know what? The Bible says we are in this world, even though we are not of this world, but this world is not perfect. It's full of demons. And they are there to be fought and to be conquered and to be overcome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you are the one who has to Pull up your socks and fight the good fight of faith. Yeah. It's spiritual warfare. Yeah. You do not win it just lying on your bed. Yeah. You have to pick up strength. Yeah. Put on strength. Yeah. You have to wrestle knowing you wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and wicked spirits in high places. You have to arise for your family. Yeah. You can't also run over and decide or uh, uh, pretend to be dead. You are not dead. Get up. I said, get up and fight. Fight for your family. Fight for your marriage. Fight for your future. You have what it takes to be an overcomer. Because he that's born of God overcomes the world. You are an overcomer. More than a conqueror in all these things. Because the blood of Jesus speaks of better things. The blood of Jesus is more powerful than the blood of sheep and goats. I don't care the witchcraft that they had. Conjured. Later we discovered it was my grandmother who was trying to not, not die because she then died three days later. So she was going to sacrifice my brother. These things are real. Ah, you think I'm not an African? So when I talk about this fake deliverance, deliverance, we've been through stuff as a family. And this is just the tip of the iceberg of what you've been through through these demonic principalities. finish. I said you have to get up. You have to grow up. You have to give up certain comforts for you to fight for your family you have to grow up in the spirit realm you have to give up some of your sleep to fight the good fight of faith to battle in the spirit to do spiritual warfare between midnight and 7 a.m because most people that die they die just after midnight when we please you are hot every night God can use one person 
to shift the destiny of a whole family. I say God can use one person to shift the destiny of a whole nation. And that is the vision of this house. And so, number two, number three. Is it number four? Yes, God allows circumstances in the family to drive someone towards their destiny. So I don't know what circumstances are driving you to seek the face of the Lord. Some of the circumstances that we face in our lives are just a wake-up call. <laughs> to make you realize that we are so generous here on earth. Yeah, when a member of the family dies, that's when you realize, ah, oh, ah, oh, Trevor Fambi. Yeah, yeah, you're not, you're, going, you're not going to live forever. Yes. Even your father, whom you used to think is a macho man, six feet under, munuese. Apana macho ipapo. Bata, apana macho ipapo. Death in the family becomes a wake up call to realize, you know what? There is a life and there is a death. And there is a life after death which is what the Bible talks about. It is appointed unto every man to be born and to die and thereafter judgment. If it is true that people are born, if it is true that people die, it is true that people will be judged. It's a wake-up call. What kind of judgment? Number one, are you going to heaven or are you going to hell? All right, you're in the church, maybe you're going to heaven. But are you not one of those whose tears will be wiped by Jesus? Because they're just sitting in the church. Expecting the pastor to do everything for you. What are you doing for your God? It's another uh, 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 part of my series, The Call of God, where I will be talking about the judgment, the books that will be opened. <laughs> the books that will be opened. But better still, the rewards that some of us that have never stopped serving God will be getting so that you can understand our passion. I said to you that you can understand why it is in the Rarit Shandira was. Because it's not Ziva, but it's not eternity. It's how we are after this life. Pano tiruku fara, tiruku jika, tiruku sasa no ne open. Ah, abundant life, tiruku jika. Muna unzwa, anti upen yu wano jikiwa. Wano jikiwa ne open. Isu su tino jika open, you John 10, 10, B. Amen. But after that, tino zi hao tu shi se, tino zi se apapi. Ah, no. <laughs> the day my mother died, for me that was my wake up call. Because my mother was like my king was there. My everything. My role model, she knows, my friend, my I'm look at me, you're seeing my mother. Everything I am, everything, the standards, the excellence, the morals, everything. So to me, she was everything. So people like that, you don't expect them to die. <laughs> but she died. That was a wake-up call to me. I don't know what your wake-up call is. I said, I don't know what your wake-up call is. But I'm saying God allows circumstances, situations in your life to wake you up from your slumber. Yeah. Tend your neighbor, say, wake up from your slumber. Slumber, kufunga kuti, every day, we shall not chingo moka. Oenda kubasa. Oh, ya wajiga. Oh, ya newspaper. Warara. Mangana wa muka foot. Oenda kubasa. Wajiga. Oh, na TV. Oh, ya newspaper. Warara. Mangana foot. Wake up. I said, wake up to life. Wake up to real life. There's more to life. There's more to enjoy in life. There's times of refreshing in the presence of God. There's times of fulfillment. When you see lives transformed. When you see other people. Like when I look at this, I can't stop working. When I see some of us, I was telling my pastor here, yeah, this one, the father died and left them in our hands like this and today they're a little deacon in training oh my god you have no clue you have no clue the joy that wells up in your heart over your product show us your product i'll show you your satisfaction no product no satisfaction so number four god often instructs you to take along someone 
on your destiny path. And take a servant with you. And go look for the donkeys. So don't go alone. Find a prayer partner. I said find a prayer partner. Yes. Make your pastor your mentor. Your, your, your disciple. Have someone that you pray with. That's why I want us to be accountability partners in prayer. From tonight. From 12 midnight to 7 a.m. I don't know what your hours are like. But find time to seek the Lord's face. Have an accountability partner. So I'm inviting you in your church groups to check in for prayer and check out for prayer. Because <laughs> a prayerless Christian is a powerless Christian. Toma dimoni tisha kutanda nisa kushika tuko kuhata nisa kushika washa yakuti it never rains but pours here kushika usanga cha ziva kuti who you were once mm. educated professor big you're supposed to be so big you even have a big stomach to show for it but cannot order their life no order cannot even keep a marriage does not even know how to be a good husband a simple biological task <laughs> it does not it does not need anything to know to, to, for anyone to, it does not need a masters or a phd kuzivakuti mkadzi harowe you need phd no rova mkadzi It does not take anything for an educated woman to know what education yako, ne what director wako, uno siya panza pa gedi, kumba urichi, urim kazi, kumba uno itose, uno guada mira baba, kuti shina kireani, iwe, ukada kuti eh kubasa eh ndiri ndiri chi ndiri chiko, what am I? Diri director, ini diri MD, diri CEO, eh, muko misa na imomo, eh, kwa kwa ita msoro miviri, two, two heads. Yeah, when I was growing up, when that snake with two heads would be seen, ah, uh, ah, uh, people would hold their heads. Ndebele sa siti, unsholo, ndebele, inshona tojiji, mashura, mashura, haumisa ni nemrumu, haumisa ni nemrumu mumba. You respect your own husband. I didn't say he's perfect. Amen. But you respect him. You honor him. Same husband if you're here. She can only do that if you love her. You don't love her. You don't show her love. You don't give her affection. Yeah, the submission will be long coming. Because, because it becomes very hard. I said it becomes very hard to submit to a hard man. So women, we submit voluntarily out of the love that we have for God and the love for the men. I don't submit because you are telling me, submit. You will submit here. Ah. No submission, no love, no submission. No submission, no love. I don't know why I'm going there. Clearly, it's my passion. I mean, it's my passion to teach. So, God often instructs you to take someone along with you. So, take somebody with you. So, the journey will be long. Number five, God allows you to go through a wilderness experience. I've already preempted this one. As a wake-up call. Somebody has been searching for a long time. You can't find what you are looking for. You can't find your father's donkeys anyway. You are failing dismally in life. Not because you can't, but because you have no God. You have no compass. You're failing dismally in your responsibilities. You've been on this wild goose chase for a long time. Things are not working, but the Lord would say to you, but the Lord would say to you, 
the Lord would say to you, about this time tomorrow, I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin. Anoint him to be the leader of my people. The Lord would say to you, this is what he has said to us. This man has been on a wild goose chase, not knowing the back or the front of their lives, of their marriage, of their family, of their finances, of their future. No plan. But anoint him. I will bring him to your place at this conference. Anoint him. He will be a deliverer to his people. And he will be a deliverer to the nation. And so, I want you to pray every day this prayer. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 16. Ephesians chapter 1. Every morning, every night, pray, Lord, open the eyes of my understanding. I was taught to pray this prayer from teenage to this day. I prayed. That's how I know what to do. Many times people ask me, how do you know how to lead the ministry? Other than the good mentorship I got from my husband. It's also just by revelation. You just know what to do in the kingdom of God. So pray that prayer every day. Memorize the scripture and pray it with all your heart. That I may know what is the hope of my calling. What is the exceeding greatness of your power toward me who believes? Which you wrote in Christ. When you raised him from the dead and you set him at the right hand of the Father. Far above all authority and power, principality and dominion. And above every name that is named, not only here on earth, but in the world to come. And had made the earth his footstool. So, allow the Holy Spirit through prayer to open your spiritual eyes. So that you can see how you too, you can have a fresh testimony about deliverance of your brother, of your sister, of your mother, I said of your family. God wants to use you. To bring salvation, healing, deliverance of your family. That's why you're at this conference. So, God spoke to us about you before you came. I will read what I wrote. God said, about this time tomorrow, I will send you a man, a woman from the land of Zimbabwe. Anoint him. And that will be the final session of this series on the call of God. There will be an anointing session. The last part of my series, there will be an anointing service. Where the mantles that were left by the Elijah, the founder of this church, will be received that will cause us to have double for our trouble because of the double portion of the anointing that is coming upon us. So God said that you will deliver your people from the Philistines. Philistines are the enemies of God. Last night, I was talking to one of my nieces and she was saying, I'm sure Auntie Gui in Kwanalok, who just lost another, what is she to me? Um, she's, my n she's my niece, my cousin's daughter. In this family, in the last, I don't know, year, when that generation dies, they're dying in twos. We lost two nieces, we lost a nephew and a niece within two days of each other. As I speak, I just lost another one last night. And we just lost another one who was in the UK two days ago. These are my auntie's grandchildren, stabbed in London from a nightclub. And so this one who is in Bulawayo who was calling me last night, 
I said, come the way in Auntie Konalo. And I said, do you think we don't know what it is? It's the demons coming back for their things. When you make covenants with demons, I said, when you make agreements with hell, when you go to those govas, kuroba gova, and you're sacrificing things and you're talking to the dead, you're praying to the dead, you're just inviting them. And when they come, don't be surprised. They will come for what is theirs. Because you will have given them the nod. So be careful what you get involved in. Break every covenant with hell. I said refuse to be in covenant with demons. You are something else. When the demons come, they manifest. But it's a hundred percent manifestation of what you've been doing at night. This is the third time. So I was telling my niece, that's why my baby, I've been saying, us that are alive, let us run away with our lives. Let us run under the covering of the blood of Jesus. Because they're tough. When they come and demand their stuff, everybody will know. So that's how you win souls in your family. When circumstances happen, tell them the truth. No, let their eyes, spiritual eyes be open for them to understand what is happening. And so you will rescue your family from the Philistines. I said, you will rescue your family from the Philistines. For the Lord says, I have looked down on my people with mercy, and I have heard the cries of your family. And you will rule over your family. And so, as you obey God, destiny is calling. As you say yes, I repeat, by the end of the three days in this conference, the lost donkeys of your father will be found, will have been found. It will no longer the proverb be the proverb in your family, because it never rains but pours. You will put a stop to it, because we will train one another how to pray. We will train one another around the word of God. How to rightly divide the word of God. How to take the word of God not as a novel, but to hear the voice of God. And understand that God is calling you. And when he calls you to your family, you will say yes. And when you say yes to that call, God doesn't stop you. There. He elevates you. He changes your stature. Where people will ask you, how did you get there? ask you how did you get there yeah. and you will know that it's not by might nor by power but it's by his spirit by my spirit says the Lord but it's as you say yes to the call of God yes to me serving you yes through the circumstances yes destiny is calling through my losses through the blows I'm facing in life, through whatever, I now know that God can use me. Whether I'm rich, whether I'm poor, whether I'm educated or not, whether I'm influential or not, I have said yes to the call of God. And when you say that, I repeat for the last time, the donkeys will be found. Your father's donkeys will be found. And your name shall be great in the land. You will receive an anointing for kingship, for rulership, for dominion. Because there will be a piece of meat. Another version says.